Good evening, everybody. My name is Rich, and I'm alcoholic. And uh, thank you to Jason, Jason, and, and Pat for uh, both having me and showing me a wonderful day today after uh, three airplanes and the better part of uh, 13 hours to get to you yesterday. They showed me some uh, beautiful parts of your country today uh, out here and um, showed me how to catch my first fish and get up early and just be out there on the river and by the falls. And it was just a spectacular, spectacular day. You all live in a beautiful spot. I hope uh, you still appreciate it. Um, I just couldn't help but think uh, that the gals over here going nuts tonight, you know, and all this, all this talk of enthusiasm. That was my uh, meditation reading this week. I do the same reading for a week and take it into meditation, and it was all about uh, enthusiasm. And enthusiasm is a Greek word, um, and, and it means quite literally when translated, full of God. And so if you're not enthusiastic about AA, the steps, your sobriety, you can figure out what the problem is. Um, and fortunately enough, that's, uh, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous does, I believe, through our steps. And in the next uh, little bit of time together, I'll get to tell you what you all did for me uh, by and through your program and your steps to help me get rid of enough of me uh, that I had some room uh, for this God that you all speak of and, and this enthusiasm for Alcoholics Anonymous to grow in me. And that's just, it's, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love my life. And that was certainly not the case when I got here. I woke up every single morning towards the end uh, with a thought many of us had. And it was, you know, oh crap, another day. You know, uh, I was the guy with the bumper sticker, right? That the, the life's a bee and then you die. You know, just a real positive, optimistic outlook on life. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, I come to you from the Fresh Air group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet on Tuesday nights. We're a big book group. We read something out of the book and actually talk about it. I know that's a novel concept in some parts of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, it is in my area, and that's, I think, why our group is popular. We tend to just stick to that and, and talking about it. We're the first non-smoking group in our area, thus the very creative name, the Fresh Air Group. Uh, I was separated from alcohol on August the 30th of 04 uh, for the mathematically challenged. I'm, I'm 41 years old. I'm in my 11th year of sobriety. I say very carefully that I was separated from alcohol on that day uh, because for me to say anything else would be arrogant. Uh, it would also make me non-alcoholic. It means I didn't quit drinking on that day. I didn't put the plug in the jug on that day. My best thinking didn't bring me to you. You know, none of that stuff that I sometimes hear in the meetings was, was true in my case. On August the 29th, I was drunk as a monkey. And on August the 30th, I didn't have to take a drink all day. And there's no step in our book for that. There's no sentence that says how that happens. That was the great gift of Alcoholics Anonymous, that one day I was drunk and the next day I wasn't. Ever since then, you all have provided me with a program to remain in that state and to live and become happy and comfortable in that very unnatural state for a person like myself. That state is called sober. Uh, if you are here and you are alcoholic of my variety, that's the problem, sober. What I really have is a sober problem. You know, isn't that strange if you're new, if you're one of those folks counting days? And if you are, congratulations. That was the coolest part of the meeting for me, watching that parade of hope. And that's what it is. For me, that is just a parade of, man, every single person that took a chip, it's like the best is yet to come. I wonder what's going to happen next. Because if your drinking was like mine, you knew what was going to happen that next day. If I woke up that next morning, I wasn't sure what kind of crappy it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be crappy. And when I don't drink for a day now, anything can happen. And that's the greatest thing that an alcoholic like me can have happen is not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, what a wonderful thing. And... Um, I'm here to tell you, I mean, first of all, I guess the fact that if you're trying to figure this whole thing out, I'm here to talk to you for a minute about my drinking so that you know that I even, you know, get to be here with you. I don't like to spend too much time on that, but our book says that until you know I'm one of you, little or nothing's going to be accomplished here tonight. And um, the fact that I can even remember my first drink, you know, is a hint. If you could remember your first drink, that might be a hint. Because uh, if my job tonight was to tell you about my first glass of orange juice, I have no memory. Um, it was a non-event in my life. You know, when was your first milk? I have no idea. 
Um, you know, so that's a huge hint. If, if this was something that you could even remember, chances are that means it played a substantial part of your life. Uh, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You might be like me. Um, in my case, my parents, uh, the way that I saw it, um, I don't know that you have to hate your parents when you're young to be an alcoholic, but it sure seems popular. Um, and in my... <laughs> In my case, they, they ripped me out of third grade to send me to a private school uh, where I could have a better education than they ever had. And that was their big crime, right? I now know from the inventory, that's what my parents wanted. They wanted me to have a better chance at life than they ever had. And I hated them for it because they yanked me away from my friends, put me on that long bus ride, 45 minutes each way to go to school with rich kids. I didn't know what rich, I didn't even know we were poor until that, because, you know, third graders are kind. They just tell you stuff like that. You know, they said, you're poor, you know, and, um, you know, and I, gr- I-, I grew up on a horse farm. I had chores in the morning. They told me I smelled, you know, like hay and called me farm boy and redneck and made fun of me. And they're, they're just kind like that. They just they think it and they say it. That's how third graders are. And um, I was beginning to experience this thing called conscious separation. I didn't know what that was. Uh, I doubt I'd have clued in or it would have helped if you'd have told me, but that's exactly what it was. And that was the first time that something inside of me started to recognize and feel a little different from you. At that school, I don't know if they do it in Oregon, they assign you an older kid. Uh, My guy's name was Reed. Reed's job was to beat me up every day for something. And uh, there's also a rule in Maryland. It's like a social hierarchy on a school bus where the older kids sit in the back and the younger towards the front. And if you go to the back of the bus, you get beat up. And, you know, Reed did that every day, diligently. He didn't miss out on his job. And uh, I've never gone back in their defense and checked it out with the school, whether they really assigned him to me or not, but it seemed like that. And uh, on, on this one day, well, I guess I also got to tell you, there was this girl on the school bus that looked like a lot of the women here tonight. I mean, she's just beautiful and put together nice and dressed nice and smelled good. And her name was Nikki. I didn't know how to talk to Nikki. I didn't know how to sit next to Nikki. I didn't know how to ask Nikki out. I didn't know how to ask her to, I mean, I had nothing, you know, going on. And I believe I was in about sixth or seventh grade at this point. And some of those older guys said, you want to skip last class and do some drinking. I'd never skipped any classes and I'd never done any drinking. And you said, I just out of my mouth, you know, you bet. Um, Like I'd been doing it all along or something. And they said, what do you drink? And I said, bourbon. And I don't know where that came from. And uh, And this is how you'll know that I had no idea I was going to be an AA and have to report back, you know, on my life. Because what I'm about to tell you next is so lame, it's unbelievable, and it's just weenie. Um, I didn't have bourbon. What they had was peach schnapps. And um, see, you're laughing at me already because it's just it's so weenie. Um, but, But what I now know is that it's not what I drank or how often I drank or, you know, what it was. It's none of that that makes me one of you. I get to be here not because of what alcohol did to me. Alcohol does to the human body the same thing to everybody. You put enough alcohol in a non-alcoholic, they'll get sick. It's called alcohol poison. Alcohol is a poison. Put enough of it in the human body, it'll come out. You know, you put enough alcohol in a non-alcoholic and put them behind the wheel of a car enough time, they'll get a DUI or two or three. Does not make them alcoholic. You put enough alcohol in a non-alcoholic for a long enough period of time and stop abruptly, They'll shake and sweat and go through all those early parts of the DTs that we went through. Doesn't necessarily make them alcoholic. That's the effect of alcohol on the human body. That's what alcohol does to me. But what it does for me, (laughs) that's what makes me one of you. And I'm willing to let it do an awful lot to me in exchange for what it does for me. And what it did that day is as we passed that around and that peach schnapps was coming around with those older guys, it went down and somehow something happened inside of me where I realized those old guys those big old guys in ninth grade, they were as lucky to be hanging out with me as I was with them. For the first time ever, we were shoulder to shoulder. I was just one of the fellas. And I went into the restroom, and I go into the little boys' room, and it said boys on the door, which struck me as funny because I kind of felt like a man for the first time. So I'm in the boys' room feeling like a man, and I'm in there, and all of a sudden I decide I'm going to get on this school bus, and I'm going to sit next to Nikki. I just intuitively knew how to handle this situation that used to baffle me. And, and I come out of there and I get on that school bus and I'm walking to the back to sit next to Nikki and Reed gets up out of his seat to give me my daily beating. And as he's getting to his feet, I clock him with everything I got in me and Reed goes down and out. 
And the whole school bus gets really, really quiet. And I sit down next to Nikki, and I'm looking at Nikki. Nikki's looking at me. I'm looking at Nikki. Nikki's looking at me. And this feeling comes over me, and that silence on the school bus, man, that some of you guys will remember. I mean, it was like finally, you know, long overdue respect. Like finally you know who I am. And we got to Nikki's bus stop, and she leaned over, and she gave me this little kiss that some of you might remember. You know, guys, it was half on the lips and half on the cheek. It was different than my mother or aunt had ever kissed me. I felt it in my toes. I mean, it was spectacular. (laughs) And she got off, and we got off at my bus stop when I got there and went into my nice little house. I have one little sister, three years younger than me, and my mom and dad, and nobody in my entire family drinks. No grandparents, no aunts, no uncles, no sister, no parents, no drinking, period, in my whole family. Uh, So any genetic theories of alcoholism, you know, right on, if that's what you think. Uh, Our book says that we, as a fellowship, have no opinion on how one becomes alcoholic. Um, If you have a personal opinion, that's cool. My sponsor told me he thinks that I became alcoholic by drinking too much alcohol. And um, I've just gone with that. And... um, And if you're new, you know, and you're picking up those chips, I'll just tell this story quickly because it'll maybe save you some time that I wasted. There's nothing more useless than trying to figure out how or why you became alcoholic. It's the same thing. It's tantamount to a guy whose house is on fire. My house is burning to the ground. The fire department's there. All the trucks are there. They got the hoses hooked up to the you know, the the water things, and you all are out there, the neighbors, and you're feeding the hose through. But I'm up front. I mean, my house is burning to the ground with everything I know and love inside. And I'm up front controlling the hose, and you all are screaming at me, Rich, shoot the hose. Please shoot the hose. But I'm up front, and I'm going, well, wait a second. Before I do that, we've got to figure out how this fire started. You know, I mean, like, what could matter less than how the fire started? We've got everything you need right here in Alcoholics Anonymous to put it out. Like, who cares? I go on drinking as much as I can after that wonderful experience. I'll tell you that the very next morning when I went into that house with those good parents, I mean, my parents were just great human beings, man. I come from a house with morals, integrity, love, good people. And they left me in the bathroom all night long. I got sick as a dog when I got off the school bus. That peach schnapps is way better going one way than the other. It's syrupy. And, um, and they left me in there, and my head was all kinked up on the ground. And you know when we sleep next to the toilet, how that gets. And I'm willing to bet, I mean, like half the room's head's nodding. You know, if you've slept next to a toilet with your neck kinked up, you know, welcome to AA. That's another good hint. And, uh, and I woke up and I don't ever remember feeling sicker. You know, it was the, to that point in my life, it was the sickest that I'd ever been. Um, I was grounded forever. And that's a big deal in like seventh grade. That's like life without parole when you get older. And um, I'm just thinking, God, man, you're sick as a dog. You're grounded forever. Are you ever going to do any more of that drinking? You bet. You bet. <laughs> Sick as a dog and grounded forever. I mean, what a small price to pay for what I had going on on that school bus, man, with Nikki (laughs) and that respect and that whole set of feelings. And what I didn't know was something happened to me in that instant where I became inwardly rearranged in my my relationship with beverage alcohol. You know, Bill says it beautifully in his story. It was something was set into motion. It was like a boomerang going into flight. That was going to give me so much, but one day turn in flight and come back and nearly shred me to ribbons. And it was going to take away every bit of morality, every bit of integrity, all of the values that those parents gave me. And it was going to do it so slowly that I didn't even know it was happening. It was going to do it one drink at a time. We get sober one day at a time and alcohol took from me or I gave to alcohol, however you like to phrase it. I surrendered to alcohol every single moral and value that those wonderful people instilled in me so slowly that I didn't know it would happen. And our book talks about that too. It says that often by the time I clue in on this, by the time I become aware of it, by the time the alcoholic recognizes this situation, it's often too late. We've slipped past that point of human aid, right? I would have been nice to know all that back then in seventh grade, but I sure didn't. And what I did was uh, this stuff was just given and given back then and given so much to me that I did it as much as often as I can. What that looks like to a high schooler in Maryland, we have 
uh, parties in cornfields. Uh, all of us sports guys, we get kegs of beer. Uh, that was back when the coach would buy the keg if you won a game. Uh, you hang out in a field or in a backyard of some parents that would let you drink there. You put your keys in a basket because nobody can drive. Um, they don't do that so much anymore, but that, that was our drinking growing up. And things are happening to me. I'm experiencing consequences of drinking through through high school. They're, they're, well, I look back and they kind of were grave, but I just didn't clue in. I mean, they probably would have captured the attention of, you know, an average temperate drinker, as our book says. But an alcoholic of my variety, these things go right past me. They don't, you know, capture my attention at all. That's things like uh, my first car was a CJ7 Jeep. Uh, it had no doors, no roof, you know, because when you're cool, that's how you drive them. I got a keg of beer in the back, four or five of my buddies, and we were coming around a turn too fast out in Hunt Valley. And when I came around that turn, that Jeep rolled like four times into a cornfield. And we were all strewn about the cornfield. And people were banged up and busted up and bloody, but nobody was seriously injured, just some broken bones. Uh, I guess seriously injured must have meant dead or something to me back then. Because you know what I thought? I didn't think like, holy cow. I almost killed four of my friends. You know what I thought? Did you see that? That was some good drunk driving right there. I mean, that was like NASCAR. That thing rolled four times and boom, and I'm on my feet. You know, and I walked away just a little bit. I mean, did you did you see that? I mean, that is that is good drunk driving. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that, you know, I had some conversations that if they were recorded, it is monumental how stupid I was. I would sit in bars and talk. I would put those words in the same sentence. I'm a good drunk driver. I say things like I drive better drunk than sober, right? I've got a method. I sit at bar stools and I talk about it. I go, you know what you do? You know, you keep the windows about three quarters of the way for the police officers. I do one eye because, you know, you keep the line with the one eye. The wind's coming through. You got to prop your one arm on the thing. If you keep a cigarette, go. I mean, I got a whole system for drunk driving. Um, and, and, and I think I'm better that way than sober. And if you got like a system for drunk driving, that's another hint. You know, welcome to AA. Most people don't have, you know, systems for drunk driving. You know, and I did it as if it were a recreational sport in high school. I would get arrested several times in high school. Those good parents, they do things like leave me in jail for the weekend to teach me a lesson. Um, The problem is, is that teaching me a lesson, you know, that goes right past an alcoholic of my variety. Might capture the attention of a hard or a heavy drinker, but not somebody like me. You know what that is? When you leave me in jail for the weekend, that's a better story on Monday. That's all that is. That's a better story. And, um, and that's what high school looks like. I eventually get to go to college. Um, my requirements for college, I grew up surfing. My dad, uh, that's still my favorite thing in the world, by the way. I surf almost every day. I live on the ocean in Ocean City, Maryland. I live about as far from here as you could get without, you know, getting wet. You go all the way to the other ocean. Then you go over a little bridge that takes you out into the Atlantic, and there's an island seven miles long by one mile wide. That's Ocean City, Maryland, and that's where I live. And... Uh, I just love surfing my whole life, and I wanted to get as far from those good parents as I could and surf a lot. So I went to the University of San Diego, um, met both of those requirements. I overlooked one small thing. It happened to be a Jesuit college. I didn't know what Jesuits were, nor never heard the word. Uh, Could have cared less. Um, I get out there. I'm on a soccer scholarship. I'm I'm playing ball. My life's starting to get busy. I've got these... um, Two soccer practices a day. It's a Division One school, so I'm playing Division One ball. Um, they're paying for you know a good chunk of the college. When you're on scholarship, my mind, um, I don't always see things right. I'll tell you that right up front. If anybody else suffers from that, you know, it's good to have a sponsor to help you see things better. But in my mind, scholarship means you're poor. I've since learned again in inventory that there's some other ways I might have looked at that. Like, what a wonderful opportunity. You were good at sports. Your grades were good. You earned it. The other thing, you know, there's just other ways to look at going to college on scholarship. I thought this is what happens to poor kids. And there was four other guys on the soccer team that were also on scholarship, which, again, meant in my mind that they were poor. Uh, They were from Tijuana, Mexico. They were Mexican fellows, lived right across the border. Tijuana was about 27 miles from my school. And uh, each of these guys, we became fast friends because water seeks its own level. You know, we're attracted to that which we are. Um, It's a spiritual uh, principle. I I really learned about that in in an inventory, a fourth step. You're writing that stuff down, and, you know, to the guys, uh, we usually write down a 
several women, you know, and you're looking for the common theme, right? And I'm like, you know, if there's a, sounds something like this for most of us guys. I've heard a lot of inventories, probably over a hundred of them. And most guys at some point slip the line in, you know, after about six of these names of women, they go, if there's a crazy broad out there, I'll attract her. And it's like, yeah, you will. How could you attract anything different? It's the spiritual principle of water seeks its own level, right? And all the women are laughing and nodding, but there's the female version of this. And the female inventory usually after about six guys' names goes, if there's a jerk out there, I'll attract him. Yes, you will. (laughs) We attract that which we are, right? And it can't go any other way. So I fall in with these guys because I'm just like them. And they each have about 36 cousins apiece. And they live right across the border in Tijuana. And since I've, you know, decided that I'm poor and I'm, I'm also, I'm a good sizer upper, right? We're, we're good sizer uppers and AA we can figure out it's one of our gifts. And uh, you just figure out the room you're in, you know, if it's a Grateful Dead concert, I'm a hippie. If I'm a surfer when I'm at the beach, if it's a punk rock concert, I'm a punk rocker, right? And um, at this school, it was the, the, the guys with the dough that were driving the BMWs and the palm trees lined that campus at USD. They were getting the good looking chicks. And I'm no dummy. I figured out I'm going to need, and this is, I don't know where this came from. There's something deep down inside of me, and nobody ever told me this that I was going to need, if, I mean, to go out with any of the women that look like you all, I was going to need to take you out first class if you were going to go out with me. You weren't going to want anything to do with me just for me. And nobody ever told me that. They never said, you know, you're ugly, you're a loser, you're stupid, nothing. I just somehow inside knew you weren't going to want anything to do with me unless I could take you out first class. I was going to need a nice car. There's going to have to be flowers. There's going to have to be a nice dinner. I mean, it was going to have to be top notch. And I sort of set on a course real similar to Bill, man. When I read his story, it it was monumental to me. Um, And that, that was I just embraced this material path. I was going to need to get some stuff. And, um, and these guys helped me with that in Mexico. So I start bringing this green stuff across the border that the rich kids like smoking. And, uh, and now my life's getting a little more complicated. I've got, um, I've got two-a-day soccer practices. I've got these Jesuit classes. I've got this lady that's assigned to me. She's called an academic advisor. Um, that might sound pretty generic and neutral to you folks, but again, um, not to an alcoholic of my variety. What this lady's job was, she was supposed to help me pick out classes that maybe I'd graduate in four years. That's it. She was just to try to help me graduate. But I don't see it like that. I think she's trying to tell me what to do. She's trying to live my life. She's trying to boss me around. And, and, and through inventory, it's incredible. I don't know what it is about me, but an alcoholic of my variety, there have been many well-meaning people in my life as I've looked back through the life in that inventory, right? Right that have just tried to give me a little friendly nudge in the right direction, a little friendly advice on how to live life. They've just tried to help me along the path of life. And anyone who has ever tried to help me, I think you're trying to hurt me. I think you're trying to hold me down. You're trying to tell me what to do. Back off. Live your life. Let me live mine. And I know later on in our book, it says that defiance is the number one characteristic, the defining characteristic of the alcoholic. But that's how I saw that lady. She said, you know, you're going to need some other things on your resume to go anywhere in life and accomplish any goals. Uh, Being a mediocre student, you know, and a soccer player is not going to get you real far. Uh, We've had an idea here at the university for years. We want to get an office of alcohol and drug education started. What we want this office to do is to provide peer counseling for other students. We want to get a student certified as an alcohol and drug counselor uh, to counsel students with alcohol and drug problems. We'd like to get you certified, Rich, and you're going to be the founding father of the Office of Alcohol and Drug Education. Uh, I say, that's great, you know, because uh, I, I know about looking good on paper, right? We're good at that. What do you want me to be? I'll be, I can look good on paper. So they do that. And I, I get certified as an alcohol drug. I know all about, I know more about alcoholism than any human being should know. I can tell you all about the Jelinek curve and where I'm taking, you know, I, I can define alcoholism to a T while I'm dying from it. There's no chapter in our book, by the way, called Into Knowing, right? <laughs> like I could be, I could just know all about alcoholism while it's killing me. There are plenty of doctors in AA. <laughs> You know, can tell you all about AA while they're dying. It's amazing. And now my day looks like this. I've got the morning soccer practice. I've got these Jesuit classes. 
Got afternoon practice. I got to drink a lot in the afternoon after that because then comes the worst part of my day. From 7 to 10 p.m., I've got office hours where I have to counsel you pathetic people with your alcohol problems and listen to all of your problems. And, uh, you know, and I'm giving out AA schedules because you definitely need to go to AA. And, um, you know, and by the way, if anybody needs to chill out a little bit, come see me after office hours and we'll get you squared away. And I'm shrink wrapping. And then when I get done that, I got to drink a lot to fall asleep because I got to shrink wrap this stuff to get it in the mail the next day. And I would have told you that my life, if your life was, I just got a lot going on. Um, I mean, if any two people in my life were in the same room at the same time, there would have been big trouble going on. If my little sister talked to my parents about the different stories I was putting out, there would have been trouble. If my coach would have talked to my teachers, trouble. If my teachers would have talked to the folks at the registrar's office, trouble. If my girlfriend had talked to my other girlfriend, (laughs) big trouble. Uh, You know. And it takes a lot of energy to keep all these people and stories going and, and live in all these separate lives. And our book says that often the alcoholic lives a double life. And I can tell you that if I just had two going on, that would have been pretty good. And, and I honestly believe that I was just drinking to fall asleep at night. You know, I got a busy life. I got a lot going on. Uh, by my senior year uh, in that college, I was halfway through my senior year. I'd switched from the green stuff to the white stuff. Uh, I bought my first house, cash, in a, a, a little town called La Jolla. It was 423 Nautilus Street. It's the third house on the right at Wind and Sea Beach, uh, right in downtown La Jolla. It's one of the most beautiful um, places in this world. As far as I'm concerned, it's one of the best surf spots in the world. Uh, I don't surf anymore, though, because I drink. And now my drinking has gone to a proportion where it's all that I do. When I drink, I drink. And surfing like like fishing, you know, today with Pat, it takes place in the morning. When that water's calm and the wind blows offshore and the dolphins are going by and the sun's coming up and God's saying good morning. But I'm not doing that. I'm drinking. I'm drinking. I'm starting to hate the birds. When I hear those birds in the morning and I've been up all night, you all know I've gotten some some bird people. Mm. One morning, I'm dating, a, a, I guess I should, I'm driving a car at that point. It's a silver BMW for you Beamer people. It's got a number on the back that lets you know how important I am. They don't make or sell this model in the United States. I had to have it shipped over from Europe because I'm that important. Um, I'm dating the most beautiful girl in the school, or at least that's what you all thought. So I dated her. I still don't know if I really liked her or not. Um, but that's how I roll. And... Uh, we're having cereal at about five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. And boom, 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 boom. Every single door and window in that house come in. And I'm on my stomach. They're putting the plastic zip hog tie in me. Uh, and off I go to the federal penitentiary. And I've, I've been arrested a lot to this point. Um, I guess I just want to make this clear. I'm a jail guy. I'm not a prison guy. Um, I specialize in like 60 to 90 day sentences, six months. Uh, Jail in Maryland is up to 18 months. You know, I do all of those kinds of sentences, no problem. Um, If you pulled my NCIC, I've been arrested 36 times. Um, I'm a, but I'm not a tough guy. I'm not a, you know, I just do jail, you know, and, and, Here's what happened. The San Diego Union Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, uh, my mom still has a copy, unfortunately, just to remind me. The headline says, Jesuit student, 27 kilos of cocaine. The federal sentencing guidelines, they're weird because federal judges don't even have a choice what they're going to do with you. There's like a grid chart of the number of times you've been arrested, the amount of cocaine, and it said 46 to 60 years. And I'm, and I'm in there, and I'm thinking, God, 46 to 60 years. I'm a jail guy. Like, this is a misunderstanding. And, uh, you know, I don't do 46. I mean, there's guys that love prison. I know I've met a lot of them, and they, they strive in that environment. It is too structured for me. I don't care for it. Uh, but there are guys that do well, and as soon as they get out, their whole life falls apart, and they can't wait to go back in. And they do great while they're in there. They go to meetings. They start meetings. They sponsor guys. I mean, their life is wonderful so long as they're in a penitentiary. I'm not one of those fellas. And, uh, but I am. And there's a couple people you're going to gather, you know, that I don't care for much. Um, I don't do well with police, judges, prosecutors. They see things. They're, they're, they're just very serious, and they don't understand us. And they take things very, very serious that you and I both know are not serious. Um, I mean, I've got things on my record. If you looked at it, like I said, there's 36 arrests, but it should just at the top say drunk and stupid, right? And then a long list of, you know, 
urinating in public, public intoxication, uh, what's my, my favorite one, right? Failing to obey a lawful order. Um, and, and then the prosecutor types and the judges, you know, like, Jason and I are just figuring out who's going to pay the bar bill. So we're out front, you know, putting a couple on each other, seeing who's going to pay the bill. You know what they call that? Second degree assault. I mean, they make it sound so serious. And, um, and they lock you up, and that's just how they are. And, and, and the U.S. attorney stood up in this thing, and he said, if Mr. Bruckner's given any bond whatsoever, he'll flee to Mexico and live a happy and successful life with his business partners in Mexico. That caught my attention because I hadn't had a happy and successful life anywhere. Not in Ocean City, not in Hunt Valley, uh, not when I got to San Diego, not in my beautiful house in La Jolla. Happy and successful. What is this guy talking about? And it sure isn't going to happen in Mexico with a whole bunch of people looking to kill me. Like, what is he talking about? But the judge bought it, so I wasn't given any bond, and then I went. And so I'm sitting in there, and I'm in the Metropolitan Correction Center. They call it MCC. It's the federal penitentiary in San Diego. And I'm sitting in there awaiting trial. And uh, I will tell you that I was the only guy in the, the, the penitentiary holds roughly 1,600 men. I was the only one that was guilty. And I know this because it's what they talk about all day in the yard. Um, and, and they tell stories. And what I now know, and, and pay attention, this is important for me. What I now know that this power, and when I say God, by the way, it's in the interest of time. It's got three letters. It's really short. When I say that word, whatever pops in your head, that's what I'm talking about. So hopefully that word doesn't separate us. I'm using the word in the interest of time. When I was new, somebody made the mistake of calling on me in an 11-step meeting one time, you know, and uh, the topic was like, God, as you understand him, or, you know, some topic that just solicits pontification. And what do you think about God, Rich? And, you know, and I start going off, well, I don't know about God, but I'll, I'll concede this. You know, I'm a, I'm a surfer and waves are energy that travel thousands of miles across the ocean. And if the swell is generated in just the right direction, a wave breaks when it hits half the depth of the size of the wave. So it takes four feet of water to make an eight foot wave break. If the reef or the beach bottom is lined up in precisely the right direction, the wave will break in the right direction. But the wind also has to be going offshore in the right direction. So you need a swell with the right interval hitting the reef at just the right time with the wind going in the right direction. And if all of that comes together at precisely the right moment, you get a good day of surfing. And I sure couldn't make all of that happen. And <laughs> my sponsor grabs me after the meeting and he goes, hey, dummy, you just used up 20 minutes of our meeting. We call it God. It's got three letters. It's really short. And everybody will know you're talking about the thing that makes the waves. And uh, so ever since then, I've just gone with God because it's the thing that makes the waves. And, uh, and what I now know is that this power, God, in this federal penitentiary surrounded me with enough of me that I was able to see me for the first time. Hopefully you followed that because it's important. And what these guys did was they told me stories that I told my whole life. And the stories sound something like this. I'm innocent. The reason I'm in here is because of my mechanic. And if my mechanic had fixed my taillight correctly, that cop would have never pulled me over. And if the cop hadn't pulled me over for the taillight, he'd have never smelled the alcohol on my breath, asked me to step out of the car, arrested me for drinking and driving, searched the car incident to arrest and found the dope in the trunk. So you can see the reason I'm in here is because of my mechanic. And if I ever get out of here and find that mechanic, we're going to get this straightened out. And if you hook that guy up to a lie detector test, they pass it. He absolutely believes that he's in that penitentiary because of his mechanic. And if I were to suggest to him that maybe driving drunk while you're hauling a load of dope had something to do with this, that wouldn't fly. There was another guy that was in there because of his wife, you know, and if she'd have listened and hadn't done what he did, he wouldn't have had to, you know, do any. And they believe this, right? And they're telling these stories. And, and, and that they absolutely believed, and I was just surrounded with guys that were so full of crap that it was just like me. I was like, God, I've just, that, that's me. I've been that, golly, I've done that my whole life. And that's what our book talks about. It calls it delusion. The word denial is not used in our book, by the way. It's used one time in an entirely different context. Denial has seeped into AA because we let it. The book talks about delusion. That's when I lie and I believe my own lie, right? Very different than denial. Denial, I take your purse. You go, did you just take my purse? I go, no, I didn't. And 
I know darn well I did. And if I'm hooked up to a lie detector, it's going boop, 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 boop. I mean, I know I'm lying. I'm just denying it. Delusion. You say, did you take my purse? I say, I'm hooked up to that lie detector. I go, no, I didn't. Let me help you look for it. And whoosh, I pass. And that is a form of mental illness. But, you know, I'm offended when we get to step two, right? You're like, what are you talking about? You know? You suggesting something's wrong with my thinking, right? And that's exactly what it is. I live in delusion. I make up stories, I tell them, and I believe them. I'm in there uh, for almost nine months. I have to tell you, another significant part of my awakening happened in there. And what happened in there is I realized that I was where I was in that penitentiary. I was where I was because of who I was. And I was who I was because of how I lived. Might not sound like a big deal to you, but that's a big deal for a guy like me. I was where I was because of who I was. I was who I was because of how I live. You guys have that exact principle in Alcoholics Anonymous. What that means is my tombstone is not going to say, here lies Rich Bruckner, he meant well. Because I always meant well. You know, you all don't care very much about what I think in AA. Nobody's ever said, do you like our book? Do you think it's well written? You know, would you have rearranged the chapters, do the steps, or, you know, do they meet your qualifications? You all have never asked me any questions like that. You know, do you have any suggestions for how we could better write the book? You know, you all don't care anything. You barely care about my feelings, but you care a great deal about saving my life, right? And you really care about what I do. You're always watching my feet. As a matter of fact, I'm told that we all carry the AA message, and when absolutely necessary, we use our mouth. So this is the least important form of carrying the message, what I get to do tonight. I love it because it's kind of like giving God's report card. I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, my gosh, this is so hard for me. I know this is just petrifying. I mean, I just think it's so exciting to tell you what you and God have done for me. What a great honor to give back, you know, and all I'm doing is telling you what y'all told me. And what happens to me is I'm in there in my spirit for the first time I'm realizing that I'm the sum total of my actions. Here lies Rich Bruckner. He meant well. That's not what it's going to say. But I always meant well. I never once went out on a Friday night, took that pregame shower. You know the one where the shower's nice and hot. It's 9 o'clock on a Friday night. That nice cold beer's in the shower with us. The sweat's coming down the bottle. And there's just that feeling of optimism about what's going to happen when I go out tonight. I get out of the shower. I put on that silk shirt. I'm getting ready to go out in L.A., spray on a little bit of that girl sauce just in case I run into one of you all, right? And run into Vinny, and Vinny goes, hey, Rich, what are you up to tonight? And I go, you know, Vin, tonight's the night I'm going to shame my mother to where she can't look me in the eye for the next decade. You got any plans tonight? <laughs> you know, but that's what happened. I'm not making that up. I never meant for it to happen, but that's what happened. You know? See, my buddy says, hey, Rich, what are you up to tonight? Tonight's the night I'm going to go out, and I'm going to humiliate my little sister to where she doesn't speak a single word to me for six and a half years. What are you up to tonight? I never left the house planning for any of that to happen, but it's what happened. It's about a week before trial. I'd been in there one week shy of nine months. It turns out that the uh, DEA agent had some problems of honesty with his own on, on the affidavit to get the search warrant. It was determined to be an illegal search of my house. They had to suppress all the cocaine. They didn't have much of a case without that. Uh, the case was dismissed. I walked out of the federal penitentiary. I'd love to tell you I walked out a free man. Anybody that's done any time in the penitentiary knows that you're anything but free when you walk out. You know what you are? You're thirsty. You're thirsty. And I couldn't stay where I was for a whole lot of pe reasons. There was a lot of people looking for me for a lot of reasons. I start bouncing around the country. I'm going from, I leave San Diego. I go to a place called Ketchum, Sun Valley, Idaho. I'm living there. I go to Steamboat. I go from Steamboat, Colorado to Boulder. I go from Boulder to Utah. I'm bouncing around. I bounce around. When I get warrants, I run. You know, I don't ever stick around. Tough guys walk through problems, not me. Uh, I run. As soon as I hear about warrants, I get out of there. I'm a midnight mover. Um, I could tell you I've left entire furnished apartments behind. If I had every television set that I've left behind, I'd have my own Best Buy store. You know, it's like incredible. Uh, but I end up where all eventually we're all big shot, tough guy, you know, drug dealers wind up when the federal government takes all your bank accounts, your cars, your houses, everything. And that's back on my mom's couch in Ocean City, Maryland. And um, I'm looking at a lot of nodding heads and smiles, which means we have some mom's couch people in here. And it turns out that that's a wonderful place to start your journey to sobriety. There's only one rule at mom's house. She said, you could stay here, Rich, as long as you want, as long as 
Oh, we got mom's couch people. <laughs> as long as you don't drink. And that's it. We all know mom's rule. And I made it, man. I couldn't even believe this woman took me back in and was going to give me one more chance. And I was never, ever, ever, ever going to drink again. And I met it. And that lasted two and a half weeks. And I'm starting to come in and out of your meetings and I'm bopping in and guys are slapping me on the back and saying, hey, kid, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm 29 years old going on 100. And I'll tell you to this day, I stand here at 41. And if I live to be 100, I don't think I'll ever feel as old as I did at 29 when I walked in here to you folks. I don't think I'll ever feel that old again. And they'd say things like, kid, just put the plug in the jug. That's what we do. I hope you all don't say that stuff in Oregon. If I could put the plug in the jug, just kill back. What we do is we just don't drink. Put the plug in the jug, kid. That's all. You know? Really? <laughs> that's it? Uh, that's the secret? Well, let me tell you, if I could put the plug in the jug, I would not be here. I would not have spent yesterday on three different airplanes, sitting in three different airports, hoping for snow, spending 13 hours to get to have eight hours with you folks in Oregon before I do the exact same thing tomorrow so I can go home with a time change and roll into work Monday morning absolutely exhausted. But you know why I do that? Because I get to not drink by participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. I get to have the life I get to have by being with you folks. And, and this is there, just don't drink, kid. What we do, you know, don't drink. Go to meetings. I'm going to meetings. I'm going to a 7.30 meeting, a noon meeting, a night meeting. You know, I go to meetings like 90 and 90. I go to 180 and 90. You know, you know what I do right when they're over? I get drunk. That's what I do. I do a residential burglary, finally, on my mom's house. She's got a restraining order. I'm not allowed 100 yards from her, the house. My mom's a retired little school teacher. Um, she sleeps with her purse under her bed in a house with a restraining order. The door dead bolted, and her little purse under the bed tells you about the previous nature of our relationship and um, also tells you something about me, right, that I do a burglary on my mom's house, right? I'm not robbing you. You look like you might hurt me. You know, tough guys rob their mom. And... Uh, I break into her house. It's about three o'clock in the morning. I'm doing a commando crawl on my stomach across my mom's bedroom floor. I'm reaching for her purse under the bed. And she wakes up and her little eyes catch me eyeball to eyeball. And she said, Rich, take it, would you? Just take it. And I've got some pretty good friends in this room that I've done all kinds of different stuff with and been swimming. And if I did, you'd see I've been stabbed across my whole stomach in Panama and a deal that went wrong. I got an M branded into my shoulder. Uh, those guys in Mexico that I work for wanted me to be real clear on who owned me. They kidnapped me, took me down there and branded me so I'd never forget who I work for. I've been locked up. You can beat me up. You can lock me up. But don't give up on me, Mom. Don't give up. That was like something different. That was something that hit me here. It wasn't a physical thing. It was, it was, it, it, it's hard to explain, but you all know it. It's hard to put words on it, but it was right here. And I'd love to tell you I didn't take her purse, but you know I did. And I, I, and I stayed drunk as long as I could before the police caught up with me. And I'm bopping in and out of your meetings and, you know, 90 and 90 and drunk and 30 and 60. And there's certain people in AA that I just, I, I hate, um, you know, any meeting that's got a book up front, you know, some day they put that right on the table. Y'all shouldn't do that with newcomer. If I see that, I go somewhere else. Um, any meeting they're talking about books and steps, I hate those meetings. Um, I, in my area, we got these ones. I don't even know. I've never seen an Oregon meeting list, but we got these ones called open discussion, which basically means people could talk about whatever the heck they want. And um, I like them again, because water seeks its own level, that spiritual principle, you know, like attracts like sick attracts sick. And I'm sick, man. So I like those meetings. I don't like the ones where you guys are talking about recovery. And uh, so I go to these discussion meetings. And, and unfortunately, if I showed you our meeting list, it says Monday night, Open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, big book study. Tuesday night, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, speaker meeting. Wednesday night, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, open discussion, step study. You know, I could go on through the rest of the week, but you get the point. And I like those meetings and the way they work in my area, you know, because I'm sick. And uh, they goes, anybody have a topic? And, you know, little Gertie, God bless her, she raises her hand. and Gertie says, yes, I have a topic. My cat, Misty died after 16 years and 
Misty and I have had so many good times together. Misty would sit on my lap and purr, and I'd pet Misty. And we used to, I can remember when I used to braid Misty's hair. And Misty would sometimes go off for two days, but Misty would always come home. And the times that I've had with Misty, and she goes on about this cat for about 15, 20 minutes, and then she calls on her friend, Franny. And Franny, you're never going to believe it, Franny too is a pet owner. And she shares for a good 15 minutes, you know, about her little dog that just died, and she goes on and on and on. And then she calls on her. And you know what happens? An hour goes by. And the meeting's over, and I leave one more meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous hearing no more about recovery from the fatal disease of alcoholism than the second I walked in the door. Maybe I'm a better pet owner. You know, my favorite discussion meeting, you know, does anybody have a topic? And my man Bob puts his hand up. And Bob's got this. He's had the same topic. He probably still got it. You know, Bob, what do you got? She left me again. And he goes on. And then Bob calls on Frank. Frank's on his fifth wife, but he knows all about relationships. He shares for 15, 20 minutes. You know, it's unbelievable. Then he calls on Susan and Susan. Susan's been married and divorced, married and divorced, married and divorced to the same guy three times. But darn if she doesn't know what's good for us. She shares some sage relationship advice because we're all so good at it as alcoholics. You know, and the whole meeting goes by. One hour goes by. I leave another meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous dying in the rooms of alcoholism from the fatal disease of alcoholism. And I leave knowing no more about recovery from the disease of alcoholism than the second I walked in. Maybe I'm a better dater. And there's some people, you know, a lot of you are here the people with that smile on their face and that goofy look in their eye, and they're like sober and happy about it. That upsets me when I get near you people at that point, because, you know, I could be sober or I could be happy, which is it? You know what I mean? Like, we're not going to put those together. And, um, and our book says that an alcoholic is a person who has lost the ability to control and enjoy their drinking. So I got to be able to do both of those in the same sentence. I could not. And, uh, you know, I certainly could not be sober and happy in the same sentence. That was unheard of, you know, what are you doing today? Not drinking. You know, that's what I was doing, not drinking. And I don't know what you're smiling about. This is not fun, not drinking, right? But a lot of you folks, it looks fun, like you're doing it on purpose or something. And, and there's this there's this one woman that I hate more than anybody. Her name's Janine. And, and Janine, God, she comes in every meeting. She's got that goofy smile and she walks in. She's got the book with her at every single meeting. And I mean, she's 18 years sober when I met her book at every, I mean, haven't you read it yet? And, and she, she doesn't call her sponsees sponsees. She doesn't call them pigeons like they used to. She calls them duckies. I mean, isn't that obnoxious, right? And she comes in and there's like six duckies that follow her in and, and Janine sits down and dish, 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 dish. The duckies file in. And then they got their little books. And then we get there. We do the chips at the end of our meeting. And we go, does anybody have 30 days? And I'm in the back where you're supposed to sit, you know, when you're new and pissed. And you got your collar up and your hat on, right? And, and does anybody have 30 days? And, you know, the first ducky would come up. And she's like, my name's Stephanie. Janine's my sponsor. I just wrote my four-step. I'm doing my fifth step on Saturday. I have 30 days. <laughs> and she goes and sits down. And, and I'm in the back, and you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, I'm going to knock her teeth right down her throat. I am going to knock that smile right off her face, right? Does anybody have 60 days? The next ducky comes up. My name's Rebecca, and I got an eight-step list. I'm about to get free. I'm doing the ninth step. <laughs> and she goes and sits down, and I'm just thinking, I am going to knock her teeth right down her throat. I can't even believe this. And then we get to the worst part of the meeting. Does anybody have 24 hours sober or desire to start over? And I got to do the longest walk in Alcoholics Anonymous one more time. I make it to 36 days without a drink. I won't even dare say sober. I can't do your steps because I'm a self-informed, you know, I got me as a sponsor. I sponsor myself, alcoholism. Right? And, and, and I read, and you all are real big on writing things down. In my line of work, a four-step, right? that's called a paper trail. The line of work I'm in... The, <laughs> When I got to you folks, I have warrants in three states. The IRS is looking for me. Um, I'm not writing anything down. You know, I just got out of the federal penitentiary. I am not going back. You all are real big on it. You say things like, it holds the key to the future. <laughs> you know, and uh, no. I mean, there's just no way. 
that's that's for nice people. You know, I figured like you folks, you all look better than me. I thought, you know, like you got the AA in my mind. Here's what my mind told me. You went out to a party one night. You had a beautiful white blouse on. You spilled some red wine on it. It was very embarrassing. And you came to AA, got sober, never had another drink. Right. And you had to write that down. And that was your fourth step, your big night out. And, uh, you know, so little did I know. At 36 days, I do. I, I had my liver biopsy. My liver was shutting down. I had all kinds of fatty spots. It turned out it was pre cirrhotic The doctor said, if you uh, eat this food, he gave me this diet, uh, don't drink. And whatever you do, don't take any Tylenol. It'll shut your liver down for the next year. I take as many Tylenol as I can take at 36 days. I just want out. I want the coward's root out. I've already told you I'm a coward. And um, put as much in as I can. I'm just done. What happens next, I don't have a great explanation for, but you folks did for me, and it's right in our book. But what happens next is my body collapses. I go down in a kitchen. I live in a crappy apartment because it's where drunks live. I fall into a refrigerator that hits the thin, crappy wall next to it. The lady next door happens to be home sick from work for the first time in nine and a half years. She had a perfect attendance record at work. She was home that day. And when the refrigerator hit the wall, it scared the daylights out of her. She ran. She looked through the front door. She saw feet and called 911. I woke back up in Atlantic General Hospital, the same hospital that I'd been in four other times from my alcoholism. And I wake up. I'm in one of those paper, sexy hospital gowns that ties up the back, and your butt hangs out, and they're just very good for your self-esteem. And, uh, you know, I'm on all kinds of tubes, and things are beeping. And as I clear my eyes, you all know who's at the foot of the bed. Janine with the <laughs> with the duckies and I'm here to tell you I don't know if there's a place called alcoholic hell or not but I was pretty sure I was in it and Janine did not talk to me that day Janine had tried to talk to me in the past plenty of times but she did talk to the duckies and she said girls I want you to take a good look this is what happens to an alcoholic that refuses to take our steps let's go girls And that was it. I know what you're thinking. Probably the same as me. Bill Wilson got that white light and the breeze, and I got Janine and the duckies. I mean, it just didn't seem to be fair. But it had the same effect, because the next thought that went through my head, I've never had one like it before, I've never had one after. And that thought was, if I get out of here alive, I'm going to find one of those old guys with that book in their hand and that smile on their face, and I'm going to do everything they tell me to do. I don't think like that. And that's what I did. And that man's name was Jim. And Jim had a sponsor by the name of Clarence Snyder, who had a sponsor by the name of Dr. Bob Smith. The only reason I tell you that is I like knowing where I got and where it came from. And I hope you pay attention to that. Because AA can get a little bit twisted up these days. It can start up front with Mitzi. And I say, Mitzi, the big book is blue. Please pass on our message. And just like that telephone game in second grade, Mitzi starts and she whispers it to Ronnie and whispers it and whispers it. And we get to the back of the room and I say, hey, What's the original message? And the guy in the back of the room says, purple dragons fly at night. I mean, it doesn't even (laughs) resemble our original message. So we got to be careful of that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he started explaining this allergy that I have. And what that means is when I take any alcohol in my system whatsoever, that first drink asks for a second. The second begs for a third. The third insists on a fourth. The fourth demands the fifth, and I want the sixth drink more than I ever wanted the first one. And that never happens in the average or temperate drinker. So if you have any idea what I'm talking about, welcome to AA. Worse than that, that's just a physical allergy. The answer to that is just never put alcohol in my body. The problem is I have a mind that continually brings me back to the very thing that's killing me. It tells me that somehow, someday I'm going to beat the game. I'm going to switch. No more tequila, just beer. A million other varieties that we find in those beautiful pages on more about alcoholism. We go through those steps and do that inventory. I make that decision, that third step decision. He told me that's just a decision to do the rest of the steps. There is nothing we care about less than any ideas you have about God at step three. You know, would you like to do the rest of the steps? Yes or no? And he said the only physical evidence of having done a third step is a written inventory in the fourth step. A written inventory is physical proof, evidence. You know that stuff they use against you in the courtroom, Rich? Okay. When you have a written inventory, we'll know that you did the third step. I'm the guy that says, how are you doing, Rich? And I say, working on the third step. 
Anybody working on the third step, right? That's what I would say. I tried to milk that for weeks. You know what that old guys know, the old old timers? You know what working on the third step is? It's code to the old timers. It means I'm scared to death to do the fourth step. So that's all that was. Got that inventory down, and it turns out, man, I'm my worst enemy. I'm the one guy that ends up in every mess I have. You know who's a part of it? There's a whole lot of different names, but there's always one that's the same. And you're looking at them. I'm the common denominator in my life. And I start getting into some grips with who and what I am and how I bring these things up over and over and over again. And he passes me to this guy, Roger, because Jim was getting old at that point. And Roger's my sponsor today. And we get up out of that ninth step, and he looks at me, and he says, I apologize to the group. This is the only bad word I say in my telling this, but it's what he said to me. He said, kid, you know what? You're up to the ninth step, and all you are an alcohol. All Alcoholics Anonymous is up to step nine. It's largely theoretical. Up to step nine, it's just theory. And all you are up till step nine is a self-informed asshole. And I said, whoa, you know, what do you mean? He says, well, nobody cares that you've come to some peace with the God of your understanding in steps one through three. Nobody out there in the world cares that you've written tons of inventory and shared it with God and your sponsor in four and five. Nobody out there in the world, they could care less that you know about your defects and shortcomings. They could care less that you got a list of what you're going to make right. But step nine, kid, this is where the rubber meets the road. How free do you want to be? This is where we get free. Maybe, just maybe, you get to die with both sides of the column even. And that resonated with me, boy. Maybe, just maybe, I get to die even. And he said, you're going to start dating your mother once a week, wherever that lady will go. And I'm sweeping the floor. My first sober job was sweeping the floor in a picture frame shop. Longtime sober guy did hand-carved wooden picture frames. And my job was to just keep the sawdust off the floor, and it was all I could do, and my little hands would shake. And he'd play those AA speaker tapes of Norm Alpe and Cliff R and all those old dogs, man, and I'd just listen to the AA tapes and sweep, 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 sweep all day and AA at night. And I made $6.25 an hour. And you know what? At the end of the week, I always had dollar for your basket and money to take my mom to dinner. And a little became a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if anyone notices that yet, right? The first thing we get in AA is a huge huge pay raise when we stop living that old life. Our book says when we focus on the spiritual, the material always takes care of itself. A little became a lot when I focused on the spiritual. I'd had it backwards my whole life. And I'm dating my mom and dating my mom and dating my mom. And I'm going to different groups. The groups I used to hate, I'm starting to like. Groups that the action group, the ones that got the book up front, the ones that are talking about the steps. Some of the people I didn't care for in AA, I'm starting to be strangely drawn to them. I was becoming inwardly rearranged with you folks and through your steps. And as I'm dating my mom and dating my mom, I can remember right where we were. We were at Carabas. My mom ordered spaghetti and meatballs. Why I remember that, I don't know. And uh, But what I do know is she's twirling that spaghetti and her eyes came up and she caught me eyeball to eyeball and was talking to me mother to son for the first time in about a decade. And we started to develop this relationship, man, where my mom became my friend and could depend on me. And she was getting into her 70s and started asking me to come over and take the trash out. And could I change her light bulbs? And just little things around the house, and I got to be there for my mom. And My wife and I now, um, I got married three years ago. Um, this spectacular woman, I was just telling her the other night, I mean, if you all saw her, you'd laugh. You'd be like, what's wrong with this picture? Um, and I was telling her, I mean, it's just very clear to me that God loves me a lot more than he loves her. And <laughs> she said, what, why would you say something like that? What are, you, what are you talking about? And I said, just think about it for a second, honey. God gave me you, and he only gave you me. And she, she's like, well, you, you got a point there. And, uh, and we live in this spectacular home right on the sand looking out, and I get to surf every morning before I go to work, and we have this gorgeous eight-month-old little girl named Isabella. Isabella is an old Spanish name that means God's precious gift, and, and she is. I'm that dorky dad with a bunch of pictures. You know, if you, I wanna, wanna, if you ask me, I'll show you, and she's just the, the, the joy of my life, and I, I could brag about the, this house that God gave me, and it, it's less than spectacular to probably anybody but my mom. And you know why my mom likes that house? If she was here, what she'd brag about, she'd say, my son chose to build a house 1.7 miles from mine. So that when that trash needs out or a light bulb needs changed or she just wants to see her son, I'm right next door. My little sister, I had a set of Baltimore Ravens 
tickets, season tickets. I don't know why I had them. Uh, you know how that goes. When we get to AA, we've got nothing we need and all kinds of weird things we don't need. Uh, we've got like a black hefty trash bag with all of our personal belongings. I mean, there's newcomers here tonight that are probably living in a homeless shelter. They don't have a house. They don't have any credit. They're not welcomed back with their families yet. And you, I mean, you're in the exact same position that I was, right, when I got the AA. But you got an iPhone 6. You know? <laughs> And I'm thinking, how do, what, how do you have that? You know, like, I don't have that yet. You know, but things are just, they're out of whack. You know, our priorities are so weird when we get here. So, so I've got these Baltimore Ravens season tickets. I don't know how I got them. I think it was like one last drug deal before sobriety or something. But uh, my sponsor says, send those to your little sister. She's in Baltimore. It's three hours. You don't even like going to the NFL games now that you're sober. You're surfing all the time and living life and going to meetings and sponsoring guys. It's hard for you to sit still for three hours. And he's right. He said what you liked about the game was being the big shot in the parking lot with the biggest tailgate and slicing a prime rib and having the best bar in the parking lot at a whole tailgate. And you were so drunk by the time the game started, you never knew who won. And he was right. I said, these are expensive. My sister hadn't talked to me in six and a half years. Why would I send these to her? That's stupid. And he said, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, send the tickets. And I did, and nothing happened. And he said, send the next set. And I did. And what happened was the phone rang. And on the other end of that phone, I answered it, and there was this little voice that said, Richie, Richie, did you see that? Did you see that? They just threw the ball. He caught it at the end zone. The Ravens are tied. And I didn't even know who the Ravens were playing, and nothing could have mattered less. But I was talking to my little sister, man, for the first time in six and a half years. And I kept sending those tickets for the whole rest of the season. We developed this little relationship around football. And we'd talk every Sunday about the game and what was going on. And uh, by this point, I had my big promotion in AA career-wise. I'm coming up into my second year, and I got a job to vacuuming swimming pools. And uh, you, I moved from sweeping floors to sweeping pools. And uh, I was getting 500 bucks a week, man. I couldn't even believe it. And, uh, and, and, but I was tired at the end of the week. And, and I, my sister had bought her first house down near the stadium. It was a little row house. And um, it was crappy. It needed fixing up. And he said, go there on the weekend. So at the end of the work week, when I was tired, I would drive three hours and help her paint the walls and spend the weekend just being a big brother and come home on Sunday to go to work on Monday. And, you know, what happened with this, it was never, the point of this story is it was never convenient. I never had enough money to do it. If I was waiting on any of those things, it would probably never be done. You'd have somebody else here. You know, I'm sending the IRS 20 bucks a week. I went and turned myself into the IRS office in Baltimore. I thought I was going to prison. You know, I owed them a little bit shy of $47,000, and I had a plan for that. I was going to pay them back when I had $47,000. You know, uh, but that's, that's always our plan, right? We're all or nothing people. The problem is I'm never going to have $47,000. And you know when I got free? When I sent the first $20 check. And my sponsor said, just go tell them. You're a drunk. You owe them a lot of money. I'm like, they'll lock me. He goes, no, they won't. They're not going to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. They want your money. They don't want you in jail. And they, they were, he was right. You know, they gave me this simple payment program. It took six years. I'll tell you that. Six years, I paid them off. We went to the post office. We were outside the Ocean City post office. I put that last check into the IRS. My little sponsor, man, pushing 80 years old, little Raj with his pacemaker. They say he's got a bad heart. The doctors do a congestive heart failure that it'll eventually kill him. Um, and that may be true, but to me, he's got the biggest heart in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he was there with me when we put that last check in and he jumped up over that mailbox and gave me this high five like Michael Jordan on that day. That pacemaker was ticking full bore. And uh, he said, say it to the mailbox, say it. And I said, my amends to the IRS is complete. And we did this high five and about a year went by and I got this thick envelope from the IRS and I opened it up and there was a big check in it and I knew I was in trouble. I screwed something up and I drove to his house and I'm like, I'm in big trouble again with the IRS. And he said, let me see that. And he looked at it and he said, that's a tax refund check, stupid. Normal people get those every year. And uh, so I've been getting those. I've been getting them every year. I mean, it turns it's not a bad deal. So after all this time with my sister, years and years are going by of me just being a big brother, man, and loving on her all the time. And this guy calls me and he says, Rich, it's Justin. Uh, you know, we've been dating for a long time and I love your little sister. And I know your father's no longer with us and part of our lives, but you're the number one man in your little sister's life. I'm calling to ask you if I might have her hand in marriage. And I'm thinking, man, there isn't anybody in the world less qualified to give away the hand of a beautiful little girl than a scumbag big brother like me. 
but that's what Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, turned me into and allowed me to do. And she called the next day and said, would you please walk me down the aisle? And I got to walk that little girl down the aisle and stand next to her and give that little girl away. And uh, she's got two little boys right now, two years old and, and, and one years old, who's going to be my daughter's cousins. You know, we're together all the time. And those kids are going to get to grow up together because Alcoholics Anonymous has put my family back together. And right in the forewords, you know, the part of the book we skip, who reads forewords? It says that the reason that Alcoholics Anonymous works is the large number of recoveries and families reunited. And that's exactly what, I mean, you, you guys have really done nothing other than what you promised, but every bit of it, every bit of it. And as this journey, you know, has gone on, the next one on that list was this guy, Ethan, and, and I, um, Ethan asked me to be the best man in his wedding, and his father sent me a plane ticket. It was when I was living in La Jolla, taking over the world one drug deal at a time, and I was to be the best man in his wedding. His father had me fit it for a tuxedo, sent me the plane ticket, bought the tuxedo. I was so excited to be in his wedding, I started drinking the night before. And you all know how that turned out. I was too drunk to get on the airplane. And when I don't show up at your wedding to be the best man, you go on that secret list that I keep deep in my guts of the people that I can never answer your phone call. I see the phone ring. And that's why alcoholics have caller ID. It's called bondage of self. I don't have enough time to uh, explain it to you, but ask your sponsor. If you need to look at the phone before you answer it, you're living in bondage of self. And many of you know to call me because there's lots of people in this room that call me. I answer the phone. Hello, Rich Bruckner. Because there's nobody looking for me. And I don't know anybody in this world a penny. And that is incredible that I just get to answer the phone. And uh, I said, Eighth, I know I didn't show up at your wedding. I need to come uh, fix this thing. I'm in this thing called AA. I need 10 minutes of your time. Maybe your father could be there. Uh, I know I'm a terrible friend. This is a matter of life and death so that I don't ever have to drink again. Can I please? I'll, I'll drive to Baltimore. And he said, yeah, you could be here at 8 o'clock Saturday morning if you can make it. And that was about nine years later. So he remembered. I think he might have had, you know. <laughs> One of those resentment things. And, and I pulled up, and, and his father's car was in the driveway, and his mother and father were there. And I knocked on the door, and I had a pocket full of money for his dad because I knew I owed some money. And he, when he answered the door, his wife was standing by a kitchen iron, and a little girl was by her feet. And his mother and father were in the back, and this little boy came running from some room, and he just came darting at me and grabbed the hold of my leg and looked up, and he said, You're my Uncle Rich. Daddy said one day I'd meet you. And our book says that nine out of ten times the unexpected happens when we make the approach in this fashion. And with that little kid holding on to my leg and looking up at me, I realized in that instant that I'm what separates me from you. My stupid ego, my inability to face the music, my inability to admit that I was wrong separates me from you. The problem with that is if I'm separate from you, I'm separate from God. And it's just that simple. And y'all didn't teach me that. You didn't convince me of that. You said, please do our steps. Have your own experience with God and report back to us. And that's what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability tonight is to tell you what you gave me. And I show up for those little kids, Ethan's kids, that little guy that said, you're my Uncle Rich. His birthday is when it snows. I drive three hours. I take them sleigh riding. Christmas we do with my family. Then I go over there with some gifts. You know what those little kids say? Uncle Rich, you show up on all the good days. Like it's an accident driving six hours, right? <laughs> But AA lets us show up on all the good days. And I made my amends with his father. And his father said, if any of this is true, what you're saying about AA and your involvement in it, you owe me $1,372. <laughs> and I reached in my pocket and I had it. And he said, but you're not going to pay me. If you're really doing this deal, what you're going to do is take cookies or donuts to your home group. No more than $10 at a time. Every now and then buy some fancy coffee. Put gas in a newcomer's car. Don't give them the money. Put the gas in their car so that they can get to the next meeting. Save every single receipt, none of them for more than $10. When you have $1,372 of receipts, you drive back here, give them to me. On that day, your amends to me will be complete. By the way, I'm sober 28 years in AA. I've been praying for the two of you since you've been that big. I didn't see that coming. My home group would tell you that they ate Stouffer's lasagna for about two years. They're nine ninety five, and uh, and and I cook them and and would take them to the meeting. The last thing I had, I had an old warrant out in San Diego for a DUI with some outside issues in my pocket. And the judge, uh, he put me on probation and said if I screwed up the probation, he'd give me every day out of five years. I was about two years sober. My sponsor said this is a great time for you to go do that five years in California. I didn't think so. Sponsors see things very different. And uh, off I went, scared to death, 
any of this business about faith and fear can't be in the same place at the same time. Just not my experience. I had sweat circles under my arm. I was in and out of the bathroom throwing up that morning several times. I went in front of the judge. Uh, what I did not know is that 47 of you took the time to write the judge a letter to tell him what my life looked like, who I was sponsoring in AA, floors I was mopping, things I was doing in AA. And that judge said, what do you have to say for yourself? And I said, Your Honor, I flew 3,000 miles. I'm ready to do that five years. I don't ever want to have to take another drink. I'm a sober member of AA, and I want to stay that way. And that judge just couldn't believe it. He said, I got 47 people that have a different story, son. You're going to go back to Maryland, and you're going to do whatever those people are doing. Alcoholics Anonymous, this case is dismissed. And he hit that hammer down, and I'll tell you what, I've never, ever, ever had a case dismissed. I've had 36 cases, and I go to jail 36 times. And I stepped out in the foyer, and I got a men's big book study on Wednesdays in my house. And I said, Roger, tell the guys I'm coming home. I don't have to go to jail. I don't got to do the five years. The judge dismissed the case. I'm coming home. And he said, well, wait a second. While you're out there, what about that Jesuit college that kicked you out? Why don't you go see them? You can't come home till tomorrow. And that seemed like small potatoes. And I went to the Jesuit college, and you all know the same dean was there all those years later. And I sat down, and I said, I don't know if you remember me. I used to go to college here. You guys kicked me out. My name's Rich Bruckner. And uh, and she was a female dean. She said, we remember you, Rich. We've only had one student go to the federal prison. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I now know what the Jesuits stand for. I know that you all stand for building men and women of integrity. You stand for education. You stand for doing the right thing. And I didn't stand for any of that. And those articles in the newspaper brought a great deal of shame to this institution. And I have no idea how to make that right, but I'm willing to do whatever you tell me. She took me to the building next door and said, fill out, all, fill out all these papers, big stack of paperwork. She said, what you're going to do is you're going to go to our law school. You're going to graduate, and you're going to go on to make us proud. That's how you can make this right. We don't like to kick students out. We like to graduate them. That's what makes us look good. And, uh, and I did. I stepped outside. I called Roger. I said, this lady's lost her mind. She wants me to go to law school. I barely can finish college, blah, blah, blah. You know, if, even if I pass law school, they're never going to let me take the bar. If I do pass the bar exam, they'll never let me pass the ethics committee to practice law. He said, shut up. Did you just tell her you'd do whatever she said to make it right? I said, yes, I did. He said, shut up and fill out the papers. I did that. And three years later, I graduated second from the top of my class in that law school. Not because I'm smart or anything. You know what you're dealing with. I got two remaining brain cells. I did law school the AA way. I showed up 15 minutes early for class. I stayed 15 minutes later. I asked a question every day of every teacher and shook their hand until every one of them knew my name personally. You know where I learned that? right there by that back door when we come in and out of our AA meetings. And it served me well in every area of my life. And I wasn't out of law school um, and passed that bar exam. Uh, it probably wasn't two months and my phone rang and it was a weird number and I got to pick it up because I can answer the phone for anybody. And on the other end of the phone was a guy that introduced himself. He said he was the state's attorney for the state of Maryland. He had the governor on the other line introduces me and said, we just received a large federal grant. I want to hire an assistant state's attorney to run the state's gang and narcotics division. I was given your phone number that you might know something about the importation of narcotics into our country. And I thought the same thing as you, like my knees buckled. But then I remembered what those old guys with that book in their hands promised me. They said, hey, kid, someday your sordid past will become your greatest asset. And I've done that. I've served, I repeat, served the state of Maryland in that capacity for the last six years. It was tough at first. The judge would say tricky things. You know how judges are. They would say things like, would the defendant please rise? And I'd stand up and they'd go, no. And I'd turn all red and get sweaty. But I got the hang of it. And I, I now know that God put me there for a specific reason. Because standing at that table, when I look at the defense table, I see me. And I see, somebody might see an armed robber. I see a guy that when the morning terror and madness were on would steal from his wife's slender purse like I stole from my mom. And I can promise you I've come up with some real creative sentencing arrangements in the last six years. And there's more than one person that I get to sit next to in an AA meeting that stood next to me in the courtroom. And it's just been a heck of a journey. I appreciate everybody's time. I get to say two incredible things every day of my life. In the morning, every day, I get to walk into that courtroom and say, good morning, Your Honor, Rich Bruckner, for the state of Maryland. <laughs> and every night, I get to say the way more important thing. My name is Rich I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for my life. <laughs>